Good morning and welcome everyone. Uh, this is Grace Lee, Chair of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Today is May 19th, 2022, and I'm pleased to call today's ACIP meeting to order. Um, I am first going to turn it over to Dr. Melinda Wharton to sh share today's announcements. Dr. Wharton. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Good morning and welcome to the May 19th virtual ACIP meeting. Copies of the slides being presented at today's meeting are available on the ACIP website or will be soon. Additionally, slides are available through a share file link for ACIP voting, liaison, and ex officio members. A few notes on meeting logistics for those who are listening in on the Zoom line. Please mute your lines at all time until you're called on for discussion. When Dr. Lee opens the meeting for discussion, please use the raise hand function in Zoom to virtually raise your hand. During the discussion period, Dr. Lee will take questions first from voting ACIP members and then from ex officio members and liaison representatives. Uh, we'll ask our members to please disable your video. A profile picture is fine, but just no live video. And we'll ask ACIP voting members to turn on their video during votes. Next slide, please. The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices is at its heart a public body, and engagement with the public and transparency in our processes are vital to the Committee's work. For this meeting, we'll be holding one oral public comment period today at approximately 1 p.m. Eastern Time. To create a fair and more efficient process for requesting to make an oral comment, we ask that people interested in making an oral comment to submit a request online in advance of the meeting. Priorities given to these advance requests, and if more people request to speak than can be accommodated, we conduct a blind lottery to determine who the speakers will be. Speakers selected in the lottery for this meeting have been notified um, in advance of the meeting. Members of the public can also submit written public comments via regulations.gov using docket number ID CDC 2022-0065. Information on the written public comment process, including uh, information on how to make a comment, can be found on the ACIP meeting website. Next slide, please. As noted in the ACIP Policies and Procedures Manual, members of the ACIP agree to forgo participation in certain activities related to vaccines during their tenure on the committee. For certain other interests that potentially could enhance a member's expertise while serving on the committee, ACIP has, limited, has, has issued limited conflict of interest waivers. Members who conduct clinical, vaccine clinical trials or serve on data safety monitoring boards may present to the committee on matters related to those vaccines, but these members are prohibited from participating in committee votes on issues related to those vaccines. Regarding other vaccines of the concerned company, a member may participate in discussions with the provision that he or she abstain from all votes related to the vaccines of that company. At the beginning of each meeting, ACIP members state any conflicts of interest. Next. We are currently soliciting applications and nominations for candidates to fill upcoming vacancies on the committee. Detailed instructions for submission of names of potential candidates to serve as ACIP members is now available on the ACIP website. Applications for ACI membership are due no later than July 1st, 2022 for the four-year term beginning in July 2023. Next. And with that, I will turn the virtu virtual podium back over to Dr. Lee. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wharton. And I do want to emphasize that um, please do apply for ACIP membership for those who are listening. Um, for the ACIP members today, uh, I will take roll call. I'll ask that you state your name, your affiliation, and whether you have any conflicts of interest. And today we are going to start with uh, Dr. Bell. Good morning, uh, I am Beth Bell. I'm a clinical professor in the Department of Global Health at the University of Washington, and I have no conflicts. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Next, Dr. Cotton. Good morning, Camille Nelson Cotton. I'm the clinical director of transplant and immunocompromised host infectious diseases at Massachusetts General Hospital and uh, associate professor at Harvard Medical School. I have no conflicts. Thank you. Dr. Chen. Good morning. Wilbur Chen, Professor of Medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine's Center for Vaccine Development and Global Health. I have no conflicts. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Dr. Daly. 
Good morning, Matt Daly. I'm a senior investigator at Kaiser Permanente Colorado. I'm also an associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. I have no conflicts. Thank you, Dr. Paling. Good morning, this is Kathy Paling. I am professor of pediatrics and epidemiology and prevention at Wake Forest School of Medicine, Atrium Health, Wake Forest Baptist. I have no conflicts. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paling. Dr. Talbot. Good morning, I'm Kip Talbot. I'm an adult infectious disease doctor at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Do you have any conflicts, Dr. Talbot? Oh, sorry, no conflicts. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lair. Good morning, this is Jamie Lair. I'm the owner of Chuga Family Medicine, a private medical practice in Ithaca, New York, and I have no conflicts. Thank you, Dr. Lair. Ms. Bata. Good morning, I'm Ms. Lynn Bata. I'm the immunization clinical consultant at the Minnesota Department of Health, and I have no conflicts. Thank you. Dr. Sanchez. Pablo Sanchez, um, a professor of pediatrics at the Ohio State University College of Medicine. I'm a neonatologist in pediatric infectious diseases at OSU and Nationwide Children's Hospital. Uh, I have no conflict. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. McNally. Good morning, Veronica McNally, president of the Franny Strong Foundation based in Michigan, and I have no conflicts. Thank you. Um, I am trying to scan. So this is Grace Lee. I'm a professor of pediatrics at Stanford University School of Medicine uh, and associate chief medical officer for Stanford Children's Health, and I have no conflicts. Um, I did see Dr. Long. Dr. Long, are you on? Yes, this is Sarah Great. Long. Good morning. I'm a pediatric infectious disease doctor and professor of pediatrics at Drexel University College of Medicine in Philadelphia, and I have no conflict of interest to disclose. Thank you. Um, let me just check on a few members. Uh, we have folks who are... Um, delivering babies and seeing patients in clinic and uh, in various settings. So I just want to confirm, Dr. Alt, Dr. Brooks, Dr. Sinaeus. Okay, we will come back to those three. I know they are planning to join, uh, but they just might need a few minutes to log in. Uh, we do also have quorum at the moment, so we can proceed. For our ex officio and liaison members, I will announce the organization name and please indicate if you are present and your first and your last name. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Good morning, Sam Posner. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Dr. Posner. Uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Good morning, Mary Beth Hance. Thank you. Uh, Food and Drug Administration. Good morning, Doran Fink on behalf of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration Office of Vaccines. Thank you. Health Resources and Services Administration. Good morning, Mary Rubin from the Division of Injury Compensation Programs, HRSA. Thank you. Indian Health Service. Good morning, this is Dr. Matthew Clark with the Indian Health Service. Thank you. National Institutes of Health. Good morning, John Bargo from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease represented at NIH. Good morning and thank you. Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy. Good morning, David Kim with OIDT uh, in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Next, we'll move on to our liaison representatives, American Academy of Family Physicians. Good morning, uh, Dr. Pamela Rockwell, Professor of Family Medicine at the University of Michigan Medical School, representing the American Academy of Family Physicians. Thank you. Uh, American Academy of Pediatrics. Dr. Maldonado. Okay, we'll come back. Um, American Academy of Physician Assistants. American College Health Association. Good morning, Sharon McMullen, representing ACHA. Thank you. America, American College of Nurse Midwives. American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Good morning, this is Dr. Linda Eckert. I'm a professor of OBGYN and Global Health at University of Washington, representing ACOG. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eckert. American College of Physicians. American Geriatric Society. Ken Spader for AGS. <laughs> Thank you. I'll have to go fast. I'm going to run down the list and we'll come back and um, catch people who might have joined in the interim. Americans, America's Health Insurance Plan. 
Amer America, American Immunization Registry Association. Good morning, Elizabeth Perillo with the American Immunization Registry Association. Thank you, American Medical Association. American Nurses Association. Sandra Freihofer, uh, practicing general internist in Atlanta, adjunct associate professor of medicine at Emory University School of Medicine, representing the American Medical Association. Thank you, Dr. Freihofer. Do we have on, um, someone on from the ANA, American Nurses Association? We'll move on to the American Osteopathic Association. Association of Immunization Managers. Molly Howell, representing AIM. Association for Prevention, thank you. Association for Prevention, Teaching, and Research. Hi, Christy Moline Jessel, Assistant Professor, Department of Family Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh, representing uh, as an alternative liaison for APTR. Thank you. Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. Good morning, this is Nirav Shah, I'm the Director of the State of Maine, CDC, and the President of ASTO. Thank you. Biotechnology Innovation Organization. Good morning, Phyllis Arthur on behalf of BIO. Thank you. Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists. Christine Hahn, present. Thank you. Canadian National Advisory Committee on Immunization. Good morning, Kelly Deeks from Massey. Thank you. Infectious Diseases Society of America. Good morning, this is Jeff Duchin representing the IDSA. Thank you. International Society for Travel Medicine. We'll move on to the National Association of County and City Health Officials. Good morning, this is Matt Dodd representing Nature. Thank you. National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners. Good morning, it's Patsy Stinchfield representing NAPNAP. Good morning. National Foundation for Infectious Diseases. Good morning, this is Bill Schaffner, Medical Director of the NFID. Thank you. National Medical Association. Good morning, this is Dial Hewlett representing the National Medical Association. Thank you. Pediatric Infectious Disease Society. Good morning, Sean O'Leary representing uh, PIDS. Thank you. Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. Good morning, Corey Robertson, present. Thank you. Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine. Okay, going back up, I'm going to ask American Academy of Pediatrics Red Book. My apologies, Dr. Kimberlin. Uh, David Kimberlin, AAP Red Book. Thank you. And, and I, my connection dropped off. Bonnie Maldonado, Chair, Committee on Infectious Diseases, American Academy. Thank you, Dr. Maldonado. Um, I see um, American College of Nurse Midwives. Carol Hayes, present. Thank you. Um, if anyone else wants to raise their hand, if they were not able to announce themselves in my rapid read of our liaison representatives, please go ahead and do so. Oh, thank you. Dr. Sineas. Hi, Sybil Sineas. I'm an internist and pediatrician, associate professor of medicine and pediatrics at the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University, and I have no conflict. Thank you, Dr. Sineas. Uh, she is coming in as an ACIP member. Are there any additional um, individuals who have joined after roll call? Please raise your hand. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, and I anticipate we will have additional uh, members uh, joining later in the day. Um, at this point, I'd actually like to invite Dr. Rochelle Walensky, the director of the CDC, to provide a few opening re remarks to the committee today. Dr. Walensky. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee, and good morning, everyone. It's great to be back with you today, and I remain so grateful to all of you and the heavy lift you have done as we continue to address COVID-19. I, of course, can't be with you today and not acknowledge the tragic and heartbreaking milestone that we marked this week. More than one million reported deaths from COVID-19 in the United States. We know that every family, every community, and workplace across the nation has experienced the enormous cost of this pandemic, and some have experienced a disproportionate share of the deaths and the suffering. I know all of you listening have been profoundly impacted and have experienced the toll of this pandemic has taken on the health of your communities, your patients, and your family. We all hope to never see the death tolls rise this high, reaching a number that was unfathomable when we first learned of this virus. The sadness I feel for lives lost, the families devastated, and the communities changed is deep. 
At the same time, we're seeing yet another surge in cases and increased hospitalizations, especially among older adults and those who are immunocompromised. We have the tools we need to protect these people from severe disease and pre prevent any more tragic deaths. With your help, We've been able to increase access to vaccines for people across the country and provide guidance for those at increased risk of disease. Still, there are too many who do not have the protection necessary as we face yet another increase in cases and hospitalizations. I'm very much looking forward to ACIP reviewing the data around a booster dose for 5 to 11 year olds and appreciate your input on the important decision and how we can best protect them. For older Americans, we've worked together to follow the epidemiology closely. Over the past few weeks, we've seen a steep and substantial increase in hospitalizations for older Americans. At the same time, only 38% of those 50 to 64 and 43% of those 65 and older have received a vaccine dose in the past six months. This leaves about 60% of older Americans without the protection they may need to prevent severe disease, hospitalization, and death. We know immunity wanes over time, and we need to do all we can now to protect those most vulnerable. It's important for us to anticipate where this pandemic is moving and deploy the tools we have where they will have the greatest impact. As a clinician, as a member of my own community, I've strongly recommended that my loved ones and those in my community who have older receive a vaccine booster dose. I have received one myself. As the director of CDC, I know that it's important to share that the same strong recommendation with older Americans, encouraging those who have not received a booster dose in the last five months to get another dose. I listened to and appreciate your nuanced discussion on this very challenging issue last month at a time when infections were much lower than they are now. And I will continue to look to you for your future discussions and guidance as we think through the need for additional booster doses in all age groups. So I started with gratitude and I certainly want to end on the same note. Thank you for your commitment to saving lives. Thank you for your dedication to equity and better health for all. Thank you for doing this while living and through this experience and the impact of this pandemic each and every day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Walensky. Um, I, I will turn it over next to Dr. Doran Fink from FDA CBER Office of Vaccines uh, for an update. Dr. Fink. Hi, thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, we are, are meeting today, of course, because uh, two days ago, FDA uh, extended the emergency use authorization of the Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine to include use as a booster dose in children five through 11 years of age. Uh, this regulatory action followed a review of uh, immunogenicity and safety data uh, from an ongoing trial uh, evaluating uh, the booster dose in children in this age group. FDA also evaluated uh, accumulated safety data to date uh, from use of the vaccine in this age group, uh, including data on the uh, incidence of uh, vaccine-associated myocarditis, uh, and also reviewed uh, vaccine effectiveness data uh, that clearly show the benefit uh, of a booster dose in preventing uh, COVID-19, including uh, its serious outcomes uh, in individuals of, of all ages uh, with the added benefit uh, conferred by a booster dose uh, over the primary series. Uh, we do acknowledge that uh, many children in this age group have recently experienced uh, an infection uh, of SARS-CoV-2 uh, with the Omicron variant uh, during uh, recent waves, uh, and that considerations around uh, uh, benefits from vaccination versus uh, natural immunity uh, will be different uh, for different individuals. Um, however, considering the balance of benefits and risks and the totality of available evidence, we did think that it was uh, important uh, and the right thing to do uh, to make this vaccine available as a booster dose uh, for use uh, 
in children 5 through 11 years of age for all individuals in this age group uh, who uh, would like to uh, increase their protection through vaccination. Uh, before I conclude, I also want to acknowledge the continued intense interest uh, in the availability of COVID vaccines for the youngest uh, pediatric age groups, uh, children uh, under five years of age. Um, the, uh, as, as has been reported, the uh, emergency use application uh, from Moderna was completed uh, just recently uh, with submission of, of data sets. Uh, and we are uh, working hard to review these data uh, and to bring uh, the uh, request to our vaccines and related biological products uh, advisory committee as rapidly uh, as we can. Uh, we are also awaiting uh, uh, a request and data to support that request uh, for the Pfizer vaccine. And once received, we will uh, move again as rapidly as we can uh, to bring those data to our our advisory committee for discussion and recommendation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fink. Um, and I want to turn it over now to Dr. Amanda Cohn from CDC for a few words. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for um, having me back, Dr. Lee. Uh, and I just wanted to share a couple of thoughts uh, that we have been having uh, related to our process and approach uh, for all of you to think about um, today and the many, many future meetings uh, we will be having. As most of you know, CDC, NCRD, and the ACIP Secretariat is deeply committed to using the evidence to recommendations framework for our decision-making process. I am really proud of how effective the ETR framework has been to allow for transparency and deliberation and really appreciate how important it is to all of the ACIP members and liaisons as part of our decision-making process. We've also kept this framework nimble, as demonstrated by our adding an equity component to the framework early on during the pandemic. But we never anticipated that we would be using this framework on nearly a monthly basis and for so many distinct questions related for a vaccination program. As the CDC was, team was pre previewing the slides for the discussion today, it occurred to us that as the policy questions become more specific, the data presented in the ETR framework is also very specific to that question, and sometimes the context is not as well represented. Um, but this takes me back to the reason why we have 15 voting members, and part of your job is to review the data specific to this policy question, but in your de de decision-making process, to incorporate the broader context of the COVID immunization program and where we are today with the pandemic and with vaccination as a whole. At the end of last year, I remember <laughs> promising uh, that we would be moving to a more holistic recommendation approach this year. I wanted to acknowledge that it is clear we are not at that moment yet. Um, as uh, I hope we still can commit to doing that by the end of this year. Um, but it's certainly, there are too many individual decisions that will have to be made over the coming months. Um, but as I know you always do, uh, I just want you all to think about following the science for this specific recommendation today, um, but also thinking ahead towards when we do have holistic recommendations um, uh, for our COVID vaccination program. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Cohn. Um, I do want to call on Dr. Oliver Brooks, our ACIP member. Could you please state your name, affiliation, and whether you have any conflicts of interest, Dr. Brooks? Yes, good morning. Oliver Brooks, Chief Medical Officer, Watts Healthcare Corporation, and I have no conflicts. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. Um, you know, thank you so much. I want to thank Dr. Walensky, Dr. Fink, and Dr. Cohn um, for continuing to you know, serve in these leadership roles for all of us. Um, I, and I had not planned to say anything, but I, I did want to respond. You know, I, I feel like it is, it is sobering that we have experienced over a million deaths in the U.S. as a consequence of COVID infection. Um, I had never thought in December 2020 when we as ACIP first approved vaccines for youth that we would be where we are today 
as Dr. Cohn mentioned, I had not anticipated we would be meeting on nearly a monthly cadence, um, looking at every single decision and trying to review every single piece of data coming in. Um, I have found this experience to be absolutely humbling. Um, we all feel we are here to protect the health of every individual, and we have good tools in hand, but I, I do think we're going to continue to need better tools. Um, and we are going to continue to need to adapt our approach to protect the population because this virus continues to evolve and change. Um, I was wishing this could be one simple answer back in December 2020, but COVID clearly won't let us do that. Um, so I, I really appreciate our committee being willing to come together and to continue to address these really difficult questions that are in front of us, um, recognizing that uh, we want to support implementation across the population um, recognizing we all want to protect the health of individuals um, and recognizing this is not an easy feat no matter which direction we head. Um, so appreciate everyone's you know, patience and your willingness to reflect on your perspectives um, and share that with the committee as well as the um, you know, public. Um, it is really important, this process is really important um, as part of um, this decision making that needs to happen. And I do believe the transparency and public nature of this meeting make a huge difference um, in our ability to be confident in the vaccination program. So I wanna thank everyone today uh, for being here. Um, and with that, we will now move on to our first session of the day. Uh, Dr. Matt Daly, who is chair of the COVID-19 Vaccines Work Group, will provide an introduction and overview of our sessions for today. Dr. Daly. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. I'll wait a sec for slides to be up. Okay, thank you so much. So um, I'm speaking today on behalf of the ACIP COVID-19 Vaccines Workgroup. Next slide. Uh, there have been more than 82 million reported cases of COVID-19 in the U.S. since the beginning of the pandemic. Next slide. Um, several hundred individuals are dying each and every day in this country from COVID-19. And as Dr. Walensky discussed in her opening remarks, we've reached the tragic milestone of 1 million deaths from COVID-19 since the uh, start of the pandemic. Next slide, please. Um, this slide shows rates of COVID-19 associated deaths by vaccination status. And to orient you to the content, um, the graph on the left um, shows rates of death for those five and over, comparing rates among the unvaccinated to rates among those who've been vaccinated with at least the primary series. Um, unvaccinated people, uh, five years of age and over, had 10 times the risk of dying from COVID-19 in February of 2020, compared to people vaccinated with at least the primary series. The graph on the right shows rates of death for those 12 and older, and these compare um, rates of death among the unvaccinated, which is the black line, to rates among those vaccinated with the primary series only, which is the broken blue line compared to those vaccinated with a primary series and a booster dose, which is the solid blue line at the bottom. And unvaccinated people ages 12 and over had 20 times the risk of dying from COVID-19 in February of 2020, compared to people vaccinated with a primary series and a booster dose. Um, and these graphs are here not to shame or blame those who remain unvaccinated. Um, we really show these graphs simply to demonstrate why we believe that vaccination is the most effective thing you can do to protect yourself against, against dying from COVID. And then these graphs also are a potent reminder that we need to redouble our efforts to communicate this um, uh, even more effectively to the public. And that includes vaccination with the primary series and vaccination with the booster. Next slide, please. And so this slide is presented in a very similar context. Um, these are new analyses which predict that vaccines could have prevented at least 318,000 COVID-19 deaths between January of 21, 2021 and April of 2022 had the pace of vaccination been maintained until 100% coverage was achieved in the adult population. Next slide, please. Um, so. Some have argued um, that COVID vaccines are not necessary for children because COVID doesn't cause serious disease in this age group. Um, and this is clearly not the case. And we, what we wanted to do here was contrast hospitalizations from COVID 
um, to hospitalizations from other vaccine-preventable um, pediatric diseases. And as shown, um, COVID-19 has comparable or higher hospitalization rates than for other pediatric vaccine-preventable diseases, such as hepatitis A, uh, varicella, and influenza. Next slide, please. Um, and this slide shows uh, deaths per year in the United States prior to recommended vaccines. And deaths from COVID-19 in the U.S. in 5 to 11-year-olds are greater than for a number of other pediatric vaccine-preventable diseases. And it's important to highlight that vaccine coverage for these other uh, conditions, these other diseases, is relatively high, um, indicating that most parents accept vaccination for hepatitis A, meningococcal, varicella, rubella, and rotavirus, even though um, deaths from these diseases are relatively rare. Um, and to state this another way, um, all of these diseases, including COVID-19, represent uh, vac vaccine-preventable uh, deaths. And it's also important to note that when discussing disease burden from COVID-19 in children, we also need to consider the burden from um, post-COVID syndromes in this age group. Uh, next slide, please. So the FDA, FDA update that Dr. Fink referred to is here. Um, two days ago, the FDA authorized a COVID-19 vaccine booster dose for children five through 11 years of age. And to, to read this verbatim, uh, FDA amended the emergency use authorization for Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine, authorizing the use of a single booster dose for administration in individuals five through 11 years of age at least five months after completion of a primary series with Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide, please. So this slide illustrates the current recommendations for COVID-19 vaccines in children five through 11 years of age. At the top are recommendations currently for individuals who are not moderately to severely immunocompromised, which is um, two doses of a primary series separated by three weeks. And down below are recommendations for persons who are moderately or severely immunocompromised in this age group with a three dose primary series. Next slide, please. So um, this slide highlights the COVID-19 vaccine workgroup activities um, in April and May of 2022. Um, we reviewed data on vaccine response by type of immunocompromise in adults. We also reviewed data relevant to seroprevalence of infection-induced SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. We also reviewed COVID-19 epidemiology in this age group. Um, in addition, uh, we heard the safety and immunogenicity data for Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine booster dose in children five through 11 years of age. We also uh, evaluated vaccine effectiveness data for COVID-19 vaccines in children in this age group. We also reviewed safety data for COVID-19 vaccines for children in this age group. And then finally, we had uh, extensive policy discussions around the use of booster doses in this age group. Next slide, please. So here's the agenda for today, Thursday, May 19th of 2022. First, we're going to hear from Dr. Link Gellas from the CDC, who's going to review updates on vaccine effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines in children ages 5 through 11 years of age. Following that, we'll hear from Dr. Shima Bukuro from the CDC, who will review updates on safety of COVID-19 vaccines in this age group. Following that, we'll hear from Dr. Talbot, who's an ACIP member and the VAST chair, who will provide the vaccine safety technical subgroups assessment of safety COVID-19 vaccines in this age group. We'll then have a break. The break will be followed by public comment period. After that, we'll hear from Dr. Shabarwal from Pfizer, who will review the safety and immunogenicity of uh, BNT162B2 booster dose, which is a 10 microgram dose in children ages five through 11 years of age. And then following that, we'll hear from Dr. Oliver from the CDC, who will review updates to the ETR framework for COVID-19 vaccine booster doses in children ages five through 11 years of age. We'll then have a discussion and a vote on this topic. Next slide, please. Um, so I want to very sincerely thank the ACIP COVID vaccine workgroup members, including ACIP members, ex officio and government members, liaisons, consultants, and the excellent leadership of Dr. Sarah Oliver and the CDC participants who made all this happen. Next slide, please. I turn it back to you, doc, Dr. Lee. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Daly, uh, for walking us through the events for today. Um, we'll turn it over to Dr. Link-Gellis. 
review updates on vaccine effectiveness in children 5 to 11 years of age. Good morning. Today I'll be sharing brief updates on vaccine effectiveness during Omicron for children and adolescents. Some of these slides have been shared previously with ACIP or come from previously published work and could not be updated due to the relatively few cases once the Omicron BA1 wave subsided. Um, next slide, please. I'll start first with CDC's PROTECT platform. This is a prospective cohort study in children aged four months to 17 years that includes weekly swabbing regardless of symptom status, so should not be impacted by changes in testing practices due to the availability of home tests. The study uses a Cox proportional hazards model with adjustment for propensity to be vaccinated, site, and SARS-CoV-2 circulation and community mask use. These results are updated from the folks at R at all MMWR published in March and extend those findings through April 23rd. Here we have VE against infection for 5 to 11 year olds on the top and 12 to 17 year olds on the bottom, further separated by time since last dose. Note that for the 5 to 11 year old age group, there was not enough power in the 60 plus days after the second dose, and so the confidence interval was too wide to make meaningful conclusions, so we did not include that estimate here. For the 14 to 59 days after the second dose, note that although the point estimates are different for the two age groups, the confidence intervals for the adolescent group overlap entirely with the confidence intervals for the younger children. In the adolescent group, a booster dose provides a significant increase in VE, bringing VE up to 83%, a median of 95 days or more than three months after the booster dose. Next slide. Moving on now to the Increasing Community Access to Testing, or ICAT platform, which is a national community-based drive-through testing data from pharmacies. This platform relies on self-reported vaccine history and uses a test negative design where cases are persons with at least one COVID-like symptom and positive NAT test and controls are symptomatic with a negative NAT test. Models are adjusted for the variables shown here and not adjusted for prior infection. We present data on adults first to show the differences between Delta and Omicron. Adults were tested from December 10th through January 1st with Omicron determined by S gene target failure. Tests in kids were included between December 26th and February 21st, when almost all circulating disease in the country was Omicron. These results have been previously shared with ACIP, but we've included them here for completeness. Next slide. This is previously published adult data for Delta in orange and Omicron in blue by time since the second dose shown on the x-axis with VE on the y-axis and the dotted line showing the 95% confidence intervals. You can see the lower starting VE for Omicron and much quicker waning compared to Delta, including zero in the confidence interval by three months after the second dose. Next slide. Now we show the same adult data for Delta and Omicron and overlay data from adolescents 12 to 15 years of age in black and children five to 11 years of age in pink. Note the much shorter follow-up time for the five to 11 year olds due to vaccine being recommended for them in November. Generally, we see almost identical patterns across the age groups, with two doses of mRNA vaccines providing roughly 60% protection initially and quickly waning to around 20% and lower by a few months after the second dose. In the blue box to the right, note that a booster dose provided substantial additional protection to adolescents, with 71% VE up to 6.5 weeks after the third dose, higher than even the initial VE immediately following a second dose. Next slide. Moving on now from VE against infection to VE for emergency department and urgent care visits and hospitalization. The Vision Network is a multi-state network based on electronic healthcare records. Like ICAT, it uses a test negative design with cases having CLI and a positive PCR and controls having CLI with a negative PCR. VE is adjusted for propensity to be vaccinated weights, calendar time, region, local virus circulation, and age and vaccination is determined via health records and state and city registries. Next slide. This is an update to data included in the Klein et al. MMWR in March, showing VE against emergency department and urgent care for children 5 to 11 on the top and adolescents 12 to 15 on the bottom. As with the PROTECT platform, there was not enough power to include VE for greater than 60 days after the second dose for children. 
For the 14 to 59 days after the second dose, we see almost identical VE point estimates in the two groups with wide confidence intervals for adolescents and some indication of waning after 60 days. On the bottom of the slide, I've noted the case definition for EDUC visit, which highlights here the potential for inclusion of children visiting urgent cares and EDs with COVID instead of for COVID, likely a bigger concern for kids than for adults as the case definition includes GI symptoms, which may have many frequent non-COVID causes in kids and could potentially drive VE estimates for ED and UC visits closer to those of infection in children. As with infection, a booster dose provided a significant increase in VE for adolescents up to a median of 45 days after the, the booster. Next slide. Here again from vision, we have VE of two doses against hospitalization for children 5 to 11 and adolescents 12 to 18 years of age during Delta and Omicron. This slide has been previously shared with ACIP and published via MMWR. Updated data were not available due to the relatively few children hospitalized once the Omicron wave subsided. For the 5 to 11 group, you can see that there were only two hospitalizations during the study period, which included two months after children in that age group could be fully vaccinated. While the point estimates for 5 to 11 year olds, 74%, is lower than the point estimate for 12 to 15 year olds, 92%, that is likely because the younger age group included 67% Omicron cases for which VE is lower compared to earlier variants, while the older group included only 15% Omicron cases. Next slide. Finally, I'll show results from the Overcoming COVID platform. Overcoming COVID is a test negative VE platform specifically aimed at children and adolescents hospitalized at 31 pediatric medical centers in 23 US states. As with other platforms, cases have CLI and a positive test, while controls have CLI and a negative test. Vaccination status is determined using a combination of documentation in the medical record and self-report and modeled via logistic regression. Next slide. This is an update to a recent publication in New England Journal of Medicine. We see here VE for 5 to 11 year olds of 68% to a median of 37 days after the second dose and VE for 12 to 18 year olds of 51%. In the older kids, we can see VE split by time since vaccination with some indication of waning at 23 to 45 weeks after the second dose. Unfortunately, uptake of booster doses in adolescents was not high enough to assess additional protection against hospitalization afforded by a booster dose. Next slide. Here we have updated data on VE against MISC for both age groups with V of 78% for kids and 90% for adolescents. We do not see a signal here for waning in the adolescent group in the more than 120 days after vaccination. And we did not have power to assess additional protection due to a booster similar to hospitalization. Next slide. In summary, for infection, two-dose VE quickly declined for children and adolescents during Omicron and followed a nearly identical pattern of that to adults. A booster dose in adolescents significantly improved VE in the six weeks to three months after the third dose, depending on the platform studied. A similar pattern was noted for emergency department and urgent care visits with similar VE after two doses in both age groups and declining VE after the second dose in adolescents and substantial additional protection from a third dose. Finally, for severe disease, two doses provided protection for both children and adolescents, with some waning evident for hospitalization in adolescents. There was not enough power to assess waning in children or the impact of boosters against hospitalization or MISC in adolescents. Next slide. I'd like to quickly acknowledge just some of the many individuals who provided data for this study, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Langellis. Uh, this presentation is now open for questions and discussion. Uh, yes, can you hear me? We can. Please go ahead. Okay, wonderful. So, um, Dr. Langellis, first of all, I want to say thank you. Um, this is um, a very important information that you have shared. And I wanted to reiterate that there was a common finding in all about the protection for children 5 to 11, as well as 12 to 17. 
Um, I think, and I would love for you to comment, that these are very um, large databases to get the data. And so it would reflect um, a lot of diversity in social economic status as well as race and ethnicity. And if you could provide some insight on that, that would be most helpful. Thank you. Sure, happy to. Uh, so it depends a little bit on the platform under study. For example, the ICAT platform is national pharmacy testing data, so it would include individuals tested through the increasing access to com increasing community access to testing program, uh, which was specifically aimed to increase testing in areas of low socioeconomic status. And so that platform in particular should have uh, very good representation in lower SVI areas. Um, other platforms, uh, such as the Vision Network, include large medical centers or even entire states, like the state of Indiana, and so should have uh, pretty good representation across urban, rural, um, low and high SV SVI areas and different racial and ethnic makeups. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Talbot? Yes. I have a question. I'm not sure you can answer it if it's coming later, so feel free to tell me. Wait my turn. Um, can you tell me how many kids 5 to 11 and 12 to 17 have actually been vaccinated? What percentage? Thank you. Hey, Dr. Talbot, this is Dr. Oliver. We'll go over uh, in detail uh, that information in the ETR presentation, um, but uh, it is um, around 28% that have received, uh, no, 35% that have received at least one dose and 28% that are fully vaccinated. Thanks. Thank you. Are there additional questions? I do not see any additional hands raised. Um, I just want to emphasize real quickly, uh, and, and perhaps you know, in, in future presentations, you can affirm this. But to Dr. Paling's question about sort of the diversity and inclusion of um, uh, participants or in the in the surveillance systems that are being um, studied, you know, it might be helpful to take a look also at whether or not there's any uh, variation or effect modification in vaccine effectiveness. I would not anticipate there would be, um, but to have that affirmed might be actually very helpful. Any other questions from our liaison members? Okay, I don't see any hands raised. Thank you very much, Dr. Link Ellis. Um, at this point, we will transition to Dr. Shima Bokoro um, from CDC for updates on the safety of COVID-19 vaccines in children five to 11 years of age. Um, I'm just going to flag for our colleagues in the CDC room that we will, after Dr. Shemba Bakoro, we will move to Dr. Kip Talbot's presentation to provide the vast assessment, and then we will open for discussion. Thanks. So today I'll be um, covering post authorization safety monitoring for primary series Pfizer BioNTech or Cominardi COVID 19 vaccination in children ages 5 to 11 years. I'll be covering data from the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS, VSAFE, and the Vaccine Safety Data Link. Next slide. So VAERS is the National Spontaneous Reporting or Passive Surveillance System that's co-managed by CDC and FDA. Next slide. VAERS accepts reports from everyone, including healthcare professionals, patients, parents, caregivers, and manufacturers regardless of the plausibility of the vaccine causing the event or the clinical seriousness of the event. Key strengths or VAERS is that it can rapidly detect potential safety problems and can detect rare adverse events. Key limitation is generally we cannot determine cause and effect from VAERS data alone. Next slide. So just, just, just to reorient you, maybe if you, if you hadn't caught the first part of it. This is the vaccine safety presentation covering um, post-authorization safety monitoring the Pfizer vaccination in primary series in children 5 to 11. And I'm about to move into data on the vaccine adverse event reporting system, which is CDC's and FDA's spontaneous reporting or passive surveillance system. Next slide. So this is a summary table of U.S. reports to bears among children 5 to 11 after Pfizer vaccination. 
in this age group, there's been, during the analytic period we're looking at, there's been approximately 18.1 million doses administered. There's been just over 9,000 reports. The median age in this age group is eight years. The re reports are, are, are equally split between male, males and females, um, where you see they don't add up to 100 is because that's a small number. There's a small number of reports that have sex missing. And 97% of, of the reports in this age group are non-serious. Next slide. So this is the um, uh, the the, uh, the the table showing um, reports by race and ethnicity. Next slide. These are the most frequent measure of preferred terms, which are the codes we use to assign uh, signs and symptoms. Um, in non-serious reports to bears, uh, on the on the left hand side you have all non-serious reports, which includes these non-clinical outcomes. So non-clinical outcomes like no adverse event, product preparation issue, incorrect dose administered, storage error, and underdose, likely represent Medicaid or vaccination errors. Um, when we exclude those non-clinical outcomes, you get the table on the right-hand side there, and the most commonly reported events are systemic and local reactions. Next slide. This is the same type of table except for serious reports. You have all reports there on the left-hand side, and then you have the um, the, the, the top uh, adverse events when we exclude the non-clinical outcomes. Next slide. So my, now I'm going to move into the data on myocarditis following Pfizer vaccination. But before I do that, I'm going to spend some time going over the background of the epidemiology of myocarditis. The epidemiology of myocarditis associated with mRNA COVID-19 vaccination, and then uh, re refresh you on some of the data that's been previously presented. So classic myocarditis in children is usually the result of an infectious cause, typically viral or presumed to be viral, although an infection with a pathogen is frequently not identified. It can be due to direct microbial infection of myocardi myocardial cells and or ongoing inflammatory response with or without clearance of the pathogen. It can also be toxin mediated or in a setting of systemic infection or infection of non-cardiac tissue. Rare causes include autoimmune hypersensitivity in giant cell. Um, incidence is higher in males than in females starting after ages five years. Previously unrecognized myocarditis was identified as a cause of death in 8% of cases of sudden unexplained death in 1 to 17 year olds and 9% of sudden death in athletes. Um, just to reiterate, it is common to not identify a pathogen or possible infectious etiology for myocarditis. Based on case series in the literature where autopsy tissues were examined and tissue-based infectious disease testing was performed, Specific infectious cause was identified only in 13 to 36% of cases across age groups. And for a case series where endomyocardial biopsy tissues were tested, nucleic acids were detected in heart tissues in approximately 38%, so that's adults and children combined. Next slide. These are figures from a slide that was previously presented at ACIP. Um, showing epidemiology, and epidemiology of myocarditis. On the left-hand side, um, we have a figure with children. So um, uh, you can see that once you get out of the, uh, the, infancy, um, the infancy period where uh, other factors such as genetic may be playing a role, myocarditis incidence is quite low and then starts to increase in adolescence. And on the right-hand side, we have... Um, we have uh, data from adults, and you can see um, really peaking uh, in, 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 in adolescence and then gradually decreasing over time, at least for males. Um, for females, it's a bit of a different picture. Next slide. So 
So this is a side-by-side comparison of uh, characteristics of myocarditis associated with COVID-19 mRNA vaccination and viral myocarditis. And I'll just walk you through this table. First, for inciting exposure, of course, for vaccine-associated myocarditis, it's mRNA COVID-19 vaccination with uh, the risk for dose 2 greater than for dose 1. For viral myocarditis, viral illness, with 30 to 60% of these illnesses being having an asymptomatic course. For demographics, for vaccine-associated myocarditis, most cases are in adolescents and young adults with males greater than females, and then for viral myocarditis, um, incidence in males greater than females, male incidence peaks in adolescents and gradually declines. Symptom onset with vaccine-associated myocarditis typically clusters within a few days after vaccination, and most cases occurring within a week with viral myocarditis symptom onset occurring within one to four weeks after viral illness. The next characteristics get at um, clinical severity of disease. And the general um, picture is that um, myocarditis associated with mRNA vaccination um, relative to viral myocarditis tends to be clinically mild and patients have <clears throat> a um, good prognosis and a fairly short recovery period. Next slide. So now we'll get into the reports of myocarditis after Pfizer vaccination among children ages 5 to 11 years. And through the analytic period, there are 64 preliminary reports of myocarditis. Four remain under review. 40 did not meet case definition for reasons like misclassification. They were preliminarily determined to be MIFC, or symptoms were present but did not meet definition. So that leaves us with 20 cases, myocarditis cases, that met CDC case definition. Next slide. Of these 20 reports, the median age was nine years with an interquartile range of seven to 10 years. Median time to symptom onset after vaccination was three days with an IQR of two to three days. There were four reports with symptom onset greater than seven days after vaccination. Those were at eight, 11, 12, and 12. Um, 14 of the 20 reports occurred after dose two. 15 of the 20 reports were in males, and 17 of the 20 reports were hospitalized. The remaining three were treated as outpatients. 14 of the 17 had recovered, of the hospitalized patients, had recovered from symptoms at the time of the VAERS report. None of these cases reported a vaccination error involving receipt of an adult dose. These 20 cases, there was one report with a history of viral prodrome three to four days prior to um, onset of myocarditis symptoms, three with current COVID-19 disease at the time of symptom onset, and no reports with a documented history of COVID disease prior to symptom onset. There was one death in a male child with onset of fever 12 days after dose one, and abdominal pain, vomiting, and death the following day. That would be day 13 after dose one. This patient had a, a rapid clinical course uh, from the time they started experiencing their, um, their abdominal pain, uh, day 13 after dose one, um, until the time they were brought into the, the ED and, and subsequently um, died was on the order of a couple hours. Histopathological evidence of myocarditis was present on autopsy and that was felt to be the cause of death. Uh, testing, which, include, which included testing, um, uh, uh, done by the infectious disease pathology branch here at CDC did not find evidence of viral infection at the time of death and CDC continues to assist with case review. Slide. Next slide, please. Uh, here's a figure showing the ages of these cases. Uh, this does not t take doses administered into consideration. These are just counts. Um, but you can see, um, at least visually, that there appear to be um, more counts towards the uh, older age, older side of this age spectrum, 5 to 11 years. Next slide. So this is a table of VAERS reporting rates 
per million doses administered after Pfizer vaccine in the days zero to seven after vaccination. Again, the focus of this presentation pre- presentation is on children ages five to 11, but I'm showing you the other ages for reference. And if we just focus on those other ages for reference to start off with, you'll see the pattern that I explained previously for myocarditis associated with mRNA COVID-19 vaccination. Um, cases are mostly in males um, with more cases after dose two. Um, the reporting rate peaks both in males and in females in the 16 to 17 year old age group and then gradually declines um, as, as individuals get older. Uh, where, where the cells are shaded in peach, that means that that the reporting rate exceeded the background rate that we estimate from the literature. And then just looking at the age group, five to 11 years, you'll see that um, the only cell uh, where the reporting rate exceeds the background rate is in males after dose two, where we have a reporting rate of 2.7 cases per million doses administered. And that is slightly above uh, the upper bound of the background incidence, um, which ranges from 0.2 to 2.2 per million doses administered. Next slide. So what we've done here is to add in the reporting rates for the eight to 21 days after vaccination. Uh, the, 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 the data in the zero to seven days has not changed from the previous slide. So <clears throat> this is to illustrate um, the point that um, for for vaccine or for myocarditis associated with vaccination, we believe that um, these cases tend to cluster very close in time after vaccination. Again, usually within a few days, mostly within seven days. Uh, and you can see that the reporting rates uh, in the eight to 21 days, um, both for males and for females, none of those exceed uh, the background incidence. Uh, we also have data from VSD, which has been the vaccine safety data link, which has been presented previously, um, showing uh, statistically significant clustering within several days after vaccination. And in VSD, when looking at excess risk um, in the zero to 21 days and in the zero to seven days, uh, nearly all of the excess risk is occurring in the zero to seven days. So, I mean, based on the evidence we have, um, we believe that a, a reasonable, biologically plausible risk interval for vaccine-associated myocarditis is in this zero to seven days following a dose of vaccination. But, so, in summary, since authorization, 18.1 18, million doses of Pfizer have been administered to children ages five to 11 years in the United States. Most reports, 97% were non-serious. Most frequently reported adverse events for non-serious reports were known and well-characterized adverse events, including potential allergic reactions. The most frequently reported adverse events for serious reports were consistent with MISC. There were 20 myocarditis reports verified to meet CEC case definition. Uh, there's a male predominance of myocarditis reports and mostly after those two, which is similar to older age groups. There's one death in a male with symptom onset 12 days after dose one with a rapid clinical course and histopathologic evidence of myocarditis and autopsy. The reporting rates for males ages five to 11 years are lower than for males ages 12 to 15 and 16 to 17 years, especially after dose two. Reporting rates for males after dose one and for females after either dose one or dose two are within background rates. And CEC will continue to monitor safety among this age group and is following up on case reports of myocarditis to assess functional status and clinical outcomes at least 90 days <coughs> after onset of myocarditis symptoms. Next slide. Moving on to VSAFE, next slide. VSAFE is a voluntary CDC smartphone, smartphone-based monitoring program for COVID-19 safety in the U.S. that uses text messaging and web surveys to check on vaccine recipients in the post-vaccination period. Next slide. Here's a demographic summary of the 49,000 participants ages 5 to 11 who reported a Pfizer vaccination. 
next slide. So these, this is a, a figure of reactions and health impact events reported at least once in the day zero to seven after Pfizer vaccination. Uh, injection site reactions and systemic reactions are commonly reported. And you can see that the general trend is for there to be slightly more um, self-reports of injection site reactions, systemic reactions, and health impact events after dose two compared to dose one. And that's similar with what we observe in individuals 12 and older in V-safe. Next slide. So these are the top five reactions reported at least once in the zero to seven days after vaccination. Uh, injection site pain, um, fatigue, headache, and fever, and myalgia are all fairly commonly reported. And again, slightly more reporting after dose two compared to dose one, which is similar to what we observed in individuals 12 and older. So in summary, um, after 49,000 um, <clears throat> enrollees ages 5 to 7 that have reported Pfizer vaccination, reactions were generally mild to moderate and most frequently reported the day after vaccination. Generally, reactions were more frequently reported after dose 2 than dose 1, and the patterns are generally similar to those observed in people 12 and older. Next slide. I'll move on to data from our vaccine safety data link system, which is our um, EHR-based system used for surveillance and research. Next slide. So the vaccine safety data link conducts rapid cycle analysis to monitor the safety of vaccines weekly using pre-specified outcomes of interest and also to describe uptake of vaccines over time among members. Next slide. These are the pre-specified rapid cycle analysis, surveillance outcomes, and the settings in which they're monitored. Slide. So for the primary analysis in RCA, the number of outcomes observed in the risk interval after COVID-19 vaccination were compared to the number expected. The expected was derived from vaccinated concurrent comparators who were in a comparison interval after COVID-19 vaccination. So this is a vaccinated versus vaccinated comparison. Next slide. These are the vaccination totals by week for pediatric age groups. And, and during the analytic period we're looking at, there were 407,000 dose ones and 378,000 dose twos in five to 11 year olds. Next slide. There are approximately 877,000 children ages 5 to 11 years in VSD and 786 total doses of Pfizer vaccine administered in this age group. That's 41% of children who have completed the primary series. And there have been no statistical signals for any outcomes identified to date. There have been 10 potential cases of myocarditis or pericarditis identified in the 98 days post-vaccination, six of which were verified through chart review. Seven-year-old male with acute myocarditis 16 days after dose one. Eleven-year-old male with acute pericarditis 19 days after dose one. And a female age nine years with acute pericarditis 14 days after dose one. The other three cases were myocarditis cases within the zero to seven day risk interval. Eight year old male with acute myocarditis three days after dose two. Nine year old male with acute myocarditis the day of vaccination after dose two. And a 10 year old male with acute myocarditis two days after dose two. The remaining four were determined not to be cases. Slide. There are three verified anaphylaxis cases identified on day zero to one after vaccination, that's the risk interval for anaphylaxis. And that translates <clears throat> into a rate of 3.8 cases per million doses administered of any dose, 4.9 per million 
uh, for first doses administered and 2.6 per million for second doses administered. The anaphylaxis rates in children ages 5 to 11 years are consistent with rates observed in people ages 12 and older. Slide. There are 12 potential MIS cases identified after vaccination. We monitor MIS descriptively. <coughs> Eight were verified as meeting the CEC case definition and four ruled out. Five of these were male, six were following dose one. All eight were admitted to the hospital. Five were admitted to ICU. The median length of stay was three days with a range of one to seven days. The median time from vaccination to symptom onset was 19.5 days. Six of these eight cases had both documented COVID-19 infection and COVID-19 vaccination before diagnosis. So three with prior infection, then vaccination, then the MISC diagnosis. One with vaccination, then infection, then the MISC diagnosis. Two with unclear timing, but with infection and vaccination prior to MISC diagnosis. And two with vaccination, and then a known exposure to COVID-19, and then the MISC diagnosis. Next slide. So overall, the findings from post-authorization safety monitoring of Pfizer primary series vaccinations are generally consistent with those from the clinical trials. Systemic and local reactions are relatively common with more systemic reactions after those two. The reporting rate for myocarditis in bears and males after dose two is slightly elevated when compared to background incidents. Otherwise, reporting rates are below background incidents. There's no statistical signal for myocarditis observed in VSD rapid cycle analysis. Anaphylaxis rates in children ages 5 to 11 years following Pfizer vaccination are comparable to rates in people ages 12 and older. MISD cases detected in VSD following vaccination had a history of COVID-19 infection or a known exposure to COVID-19 prior to MISC diagnosis. And enhanced safety monitoring continues including follow-up on recovery status and longer-term outcomes in myocarditis case reports. But I want to remind individuals that our clinical immunization safety assessment project is available to perform clinical case consultations uh, for U.S. healthcare providers um, with complex uh, cases of adverse events following immunization. Next slide. I especially want to remind our public health partners and our healthcare partners in practice um, that we need your help in enrolling children into VSAFE, um, particularly as um, younger children um, may be vaccinated coming up soon. Um, this, this basically requires uh, uh, parents to enroll uh, their children. Um, and as far as how can healthcare providers help us with this process. Please provide VSAFE information sheets to your parent, to the patients, <clears throat> parents and patients. Ideally, this should occur prior to vaccination for young children. Please display posters of VSAFE and direct patients to vsafe.cec.gov to enroll. Um, we need your help in this process, and this is a very important way that we collect information early on as the vaccination program is rolling out. Next slide. I'd like to acknowledge the following groups for their contributions to vaccine safety monitoring. Next slide. Next slide. That concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to take questions. Um, thank you, Dr. Shalipakora. Actually, I think what we're going to do is we're going to ask our colleagues in the CDC room to switch over to Dr. Talbot's presentation, and we'll take questions on both your presentations at the end. Um, I actually want, as, as you're transitioning to Dr. Talbot's presentation, um, I know Dr. Alt has been able to join and joined a little while ago. I am hoping he might be able to announce himself. Uh, and Dr. Alt, if you can state your name, your affiliation, and whether you have any conflicts of interest, we'd appreciate it. My name is Kevin Alt, and I'm an obstetrician gynecologist at the University of Kansas Hospital in Kansas City, Kansas. I have no conflicts. My participation in the meeting today is probably going to be limited because I have clinical duties today. Thank you, Dr. Allen. We appreciate you joining for whenever you can. Um, terrific. Uh, are we ready to go for Dr. Talbot's 
presentation. Slides are up. It looks good. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Dr. Talbot. Go ahead. Hey, so I'm presenting on behalf of myself and Dr. Hopkins, who's the NVAC um, chair for VAST. VAST stands for the Vaccine Technical Technical Work Group, and this will be a summary of what we have reviewed and our assessments of that. Next slide, please. So this is a reminder. The objectives of VAST include the following. Review, evaluate, and interpret post-authorization and approval COVID-19 vaccination safety data. To serve as the central hub for technical subject matter expertise from federal agencies conducting post-authorization approval and safety monitoring. Advise on analyses, interpretation, and presentation of vaccine safety data. Provide updates to the ACIP COVID-19 vaccines work group and the entire ACIP on COVID-19 vaccine safety. We have had meetings, we've had meetings almost weekly since December 21st. In total, there have been 57 meetings to review vaccine safety data. Next slide. So this report will cover the assessment of boosters um, in children. Let me restart over again. This assessment was done in preparation to discuss the booster dose in five to 11 year olds. So specifically, VAST reviewed the most recent data from the three U.S. safety monitoring systems, which include BEARS, BSAFE, and BSD. Safety after the primary vaccination series in five to 11 year olds was reviewed. And then safety after booster doses in 12 to 15 year olds were reviewed. And that's because that is the youngest age group for which boosters have been previously authorized. 18.1 million doses of Pfizer-BioNTech have been administered to children ages 5 to 11 years of age. In bears, reporting rate for myocarditis among males is lower in those ages 5 to 11 than in those 12 to 15 years of age. In the VSD rapid cycle analysis, at this time, there's no statistical safety signal after over 700,000 doses have been given in children 5 to 11 years of age. Therefore, data do not suggest potential safety concerns regarding a Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine booster for children 5 to 11 years of age beyond those previously identified in older age groups. Next slide. I'm going to change topic slightly. VAS decided to review how mortality was followed and assessed following COVID-19 vaccinations. The CDC Immunization Safety Office and FDA have a standard and systemic methods for following up on all reported deaths following vaccination. Because of the importance of mortality as a potential adverse event following vaccination, VAS has reviewed mortality data as available from several systems. Population-based studies conducted to date have not identified increased risk of death following COVID-19 vaccination. Spontaneous reporting to VAERS has not identified any unusual reporting or patterns of causes of death. Next slide. In a cohort of 6.4 million COVID-19 vaccinees, in 4.6 demographically similar unvaccinated persons, no increased risk of mortality was seen among COVID-19 vaccine recipients. Among 20,000 nursing home residents in 284 facilities, no increase in seven-day mortality was seen following COVID-19 vaccination. Among deaths reported to theirs following COVID-19 vaccination, Bayesian data mining identified no signal other than mortality due to COVID-19 vaccine disease, which would be vaccine failure following adenovirus 26 COVID-2 vaccine. No unusual clustering of deaths, causes of death were associated with U.S. authorized COVID-19 vaccines. Next slide. So VAS will continue to review vaccine safety data from multiple U.S. safety systems in specific age groups and after primary series and booster doses. 
We will continue to collaborate with global vaccine safety colleagues on key issues and also our colleagues here in the United States. And we will provide updates to the ACIP work group and ACIP at future meetings. Next slide. I cannot say thank you enough to the members who have attended all of these meetings and given their expert advice and also all of our ex officio and liaison representatives who have brought data from multiple different monitoring systems in the United States. And especially our co-leads, Lori Markowitz and Melinda Wharton. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Talbot. Um, these two presentations are now open for questions. And um, Dr. Long, I did not forget about you. So if there is a question you'd like to ask Dr. Uh, Ruth Link Gillis, please uh, feel free to go ahead as we're waiting for other hands to be raised. I think it's going to come up again, uh, Doctor, after Dr. Oliver's presentation. So I will wait on that one. Okay, thank you, Dr. Long. Mm -hmm. um, are there any questions from ACI members, ACIP members, about the um, safety presentations? Ms. McNally. Thank you. Just for the benefit of the public, Dr. Shimabukuro, can you describe what it means to complete a chart review? Uh, well, I, I, are you referring to VAERS? Are you referring to the VAERS myocarditis cases? Uh, no. Well, perhaps it's it's helpful in that context too. But I was really talking more about VSD. Oh, sure. Um, uh, for, so, for v VSD is an electronic health record based system. So we have complete information on patients uh, from from the electronic health record to include vaccination status and uh, to include encounters with the healthcare system and the clinical record and laboratory results. Um, so a chart review is, is really accessing the electronic health record and abstracting that information um, and then applying a, a standardized case definition. Um, for, the, for the example of myocarditis, it's applying the CDC um, case definition for myocarditis and seeing if the information that's available from the, the medical record um, is sufficient to verify that that's a myocarditis case, um, or if there's information to suggest otherwise, it's, for example, it's not a myocarditis case, or it may be a prevalent case, so it existed before, to make that determination. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Long? Um, yes, thanks so much for the um, data, Dr. Shimabukor. I, I, I'm sorry to have to make you speak because I think it could be painful on your end with your cough. Um, this is kind of a complicated question, but first of all, I would have to say again, as I've said before, although I know you like to have background uh, and you like to compare the rates compared with background rates, um, um, viral myocarditis and post-vaccine myopericarditis are very different, as you pointed out, in all of their manifestations. And I think that the myopericarditis post-vaccination is as unique as the cerebral um, thrombosis and thrombocytopenia. So I I'm more likely to look at these events on their face value and um, the rate of occurrence. So um, one thing is that although you summarized that the onset of vaccine-associated uh, myopericarditis was maybe um, at three days, uh, I think that your data <coughs> would show that there are two clusters. One is in the first day or two around vaccination where I bet the number would be one, maybe one point something post-vaccination. And then there are these stragglers that occur in the second week. Um, so I think it, I, I, I don't know how you decide to justify looking at them differently, but a median of three days, I don't think uh, that would be not what um, uh, m uh, most people would present with. So when you have, um, uh, disparate clusters that makes that a little bit confusing. But my question is this. These vaccinations are not occurring in a void in a vacuum right now. They're occurring with an enormous 
rate of infections uh, in children of this age group and slightly older. And what we knew from the early reports of the few cases of myopericarditis that occurred following the first dose, they typically were more likely to be in the second week. And when they were looked at very carefully, many of them were associated with an intercurrent coronavirus SARS-2 infection. And so I wonder if there is any way that we can, I, I wish this, the patients would be studied better at the time they appear with their myopericarditis to try to understand is this vaccine associated pure and simple, which seems to be very predominantly right after dose number two, or is it associated with vaccine and infection, which is becoming increasingly um, common, and we might see the rate of myopericarditis higher when we're having an outbreak uh, of, of lots and lots of disease. That's one thing, if you have any thoughts about that. And the other thing that would be reassuring to me would be to see any data on myopericarditis occurring after a booster dose in that 12 to 17 year old age group. Uh, to ask, not, answer your, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say not necessarily that last one in people who had previous myocarditis, that's been reported, but in those who did fine with their first vaccine, uh, two doses, and then on the booster dose had their first episode of myopericarditis because that might be also happening with more intercurrent uh, coronavirus infection. So, sorry, very long thing. I don't know if you can answer any of it or if you're thinking that there's any merit in thinking about it. So we, we did present back in April uh, safety data um, on, on booster dose, the first booster dose after the primary series. And um, there, there, are, there, is, there are myocarditis cases that do occur after the after a booster dose, um, and uh, and and there there appears to be uh, uh, an increased risk of myocarditis associated with the booster dose, similar to um, what there is after dose two and after dose one. But the magnitude of the of the risk appears to be um, lower, uh, in some cases substantially lower than after dose two. Um, so that uh, we we have that data um, and. Um, uh, it, it, probably we've accumulated additional data since April, so that that data is certainly available. We'd be happy to present that on a future call. Uh, I think with with respect to it, in, infection, I'm going to go backwards actually from your third to your second to your first question. But with respect to in, infection, and I believe we have um, VSD investigators on the call. I I, I think that that it's actually a, a fairly small percentage of the myocarditis cases that have evidence in the EHR uh, of, of infection. Um, that's not to say that they weren't infected because not every case, at least recently, may be captured in the electronic health record, but where we have information, um, that, that was a, a, fairly, um, a fairly rare event uh, that these cases had prior infection. And then, um, and then with respect to uh, myocarditis associated with COVID disease, I think that Dr. Matt Oster, who is a pediatric cardiologist, and I believe he's on the call, might be, might be in best position to answer that question. And if uh, Dr. Klein or other VSD folks um, have anything to add about the, the, the rate of prior infection, I, I mean, feel free to jump in. May I just ask a, cl a clarifying question of what you what you said about uh, are are you saying there were a significant number of children with myopericarditis, for instance, after the first dose or in the second week after any dose, who were investigated by the proper serology to distinguish vaccine from infection, and they were negative, or that they, you know, most people would not do that. Most people would not think about doing that. 
So are you saying there are significant serologic data that suggests this did not happen, that there was not infection, or that you don't have the data? No, I, I, I can't answer that question. What I can say is that is that the, the, the percentage of, of infected, of cases where there was evidence of infection is, is, is pretty low. And I, I'm actually not aware of a, sort of a bimodal uh, peak. And I think all the data that we have is that these cases, whether it's dose one or dose two, they tend to occur fairly shortly after vaccination, usually within a few days, mostly within a week. Um, uh, you know, certainly the, certainly the rates are higher and the rates are higher after this. That's a question you had posed about. Oh, no, I was going to say the, the rates, the, the rates are higher after after dose two, but I think the you know the, the, the pattern of onset is, is 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 similar in that they tend to be mostly occur after after a week of within the first week of vaccination. Matt, I don't know if you were going or if you had a hot mic. Go, go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So cases of myocarditis after vaccine that had an actual COVID infection, while it can sometimes occur. You know, COVID leading to myocarditis, it, just acute regular myocarditis is pretty rare in the younger age group, um, meaning adolescents and younger kids, but it can happen. Um, more commonly, as you showed in one of your slides, we do see a number, and there have been a number of bears reports of MISC in some of the myocarditis cases, as you showed, were actually a component of MISC, and we do see that quite often following uh, COVID infection in, in younger children. Uh, but not so much the, the COVID myocarditis is a bit rarer uh, than the MIC for sure. Um, just to clarify, the um, I, I think with Dr. Long, and, and Dr. Long, you can tell me <laughs> um, yeah. if I get this wrong, but I think the fundamental nature of the question is um, when there is a case of myocarditis, independent of what we know about, you know, uh, etiology, um, it, it, sort of what is the routine workup that's typically done? Uh, I think the question is, do we have complete information on all the cases? My assumption is we have the information that whoever the frontline clinician happened to be did in terms of their evaluation and workup. Um, but we don't necessarily um, have the complete information we would always want about every case because these are cases that are being worked up on the front line. Is that your question, Dr. Long? Uh, that is the question, and, and the second part of it is I'm, I'm not suggesting that these are children who have their myopic carditis following vaccination in the second to third to fourth week after vaccination I'm not suggesting that they have coronavirus myocarditis. I'm suggesting they usually have asymptomatic infection, but have a high antibody titer. Since we really think this is probably a lot of vaccine antigen or um, um, a marker or whatever, spike protein, and in the presence of high antibodies so that they may have had their, their I, I'm thinking, the cases that I have managed for um, the Journal of Pediatrics and, and thought about as we've seen this difference in the first two days versus a little later on. And it, it, with all due respect, the, the, from the rapid cycle analysis, half of the myocarditis cases were in the second week and only half of them were right after the first dose. So I think there's a variable possibility of what the bad um, uh, uh, things could happen together that could lead to myopericarditis that may be more common as we're seeing asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic coronavirus infections and then we're coming back with vaccines. So I, 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 I've taken enough time. I appreciate you've considered it. And it sounds like we don't have the information we need. So this is Dr. Klein. I just want to comment quickly. I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I do want to comment that while half the 5 to 11-year-old cases that we identified were in the first weeks after vaccination, um, most of those ones later on were pericarditis for the 5 to 11-year-olds. 
Um, and the, the younger ones are the, I mean, excuse me, the ones in the first week were the myocarditis cases. And, and I do want to reemphasize what Dr. Shimmer Bakura said that we have no evidence that we have any clustering past the first week in any of our analysis, both in adolescents for the, both the primary series and the booster doses for myocarditis, as well as for the older individual, older young adults and, um, that we've seen in many analyses. Thank you, Dr. Klein. Thanks for that clarification. Um, Dr. Lair? So, thank you for your presentation. My question is, is about the relative risk. And I think what many people are wondering is, if they were to get COVID vaccine, what's their risk of myocarditis, both for the little kids and also for the adolescents? But if they were to get the COVID disease without having had the vaccine, what's their risk of getting cardiac disease from either directly from myocarditis, pericarditis, or from MISC? And I'm wondering if anyone has that information. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, D Dr. Lee, um, given your work in that area with the, um, the, the Cornet study, I mean, you may be, you and Dr. Oster may be best positioned to answer that question. It's, that's more of a benefit risk type um, question than a, a straight vaccine safety question. Uh, Dr. Oster, do you want to go ahead first, and then I'm happy to chime in? Or would you like me to chime in? Either way is fine. <laughs> no, I can go. I was trying to pull up so I can give you the actual numbers while I'm doing that on the computer here. Um, but no, that's an excellent question, and we, we did address this um, using another data source, the Cornet, uh, as Dr. Shimizukoro alluded to, with a number of investigators uh, at CDC and outside of CDC. And this was published uh, in MMWR um, in, on April 8th. Uh, to answer just that question, though, what is the risk of overall cardiac complications um, with COVID-19 uh, infection um, versus getting vaccination? And we show that for all age groups and all sexes that your risk of getting cardiac complications is certainly higher with getting COVID-19 infection uh, as opposed to, you know, when you get vaccination. Um, you know, that includes, you know, myocarditis, also, you know, MISC uh, and pericarditis, um, you know, significant cardiac involvement there. Um, and, you know, even in the, the highest risk group, obviously, is the teen boys. Um, to have the adverse event after vaccination. Uh, and even in that group, the risk of heart complications after infection compared to vaccination uh, was two to six times higher um, after infection. Does that okay. answer your question? It does, and I think that's an important point for the general public to recognize and to sort of reemphasize that your risk of these complications are higher with the disease than with the vaccination. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oster and Dr. Lair. I'll only add that, um, you know, vaccine safety is not in its own bubble. It is, um, as Dr. Shimabukoro mentioned, uh, it's the benefit risk. And we know that in general, uh, complications after infection seem to lead to more severe disease. Um, and particularly uh, what's been documented in the Israeli study and this particular MMW article that Dr. Oster mentioned uh, focuses on cardiac disease specifically. Are there any additional questions? Okay, with that, um, we are running a little behind schedule. Um, so I would like to call for a short break before we move to public comment. So we'll, uh, we'll break and come back at 17 minutes after the hour. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>